Our lesson today comes from uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, it's on Christ's superior sacrifice. Now, last week we started Hebrews 10, and we said that there were three reasons why Christ's sacrifice is superior. This is reason number two. Reason number one was Christ's sacrifice takes away sin. Did the old uh, sacrifices under the Old Testament, did they take away sin? No. They just went forward and they were remembered again the next year and here we go. Well, today we're going to listen to number two. It comes from verses 11 through 18. And here it is. The very next slide, the very next thing. Christ's sacrifice need never be repeated. How many times did they have to repeat the sacrifices? Every year. Every year. But here's something else. The Old Testament priests stand daily, Hebrews 10 says. That doesn't mean anything to us, but to the Jewish mind, it was huge. To stand. Do you remember when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount? He went up to a mountain, and he did what? No, he sat down. The people who were learners stood. The people who were teachers sat. The distinguish is that he's a master. He's honored. And we stand before him. So, when Christ went to heaven, it's explicitly stated, what? He sat down. In our minds, that's nothing. The difference in the priest standing and the Lord sitting is huge in their minds. It puts a place to it. It puts a, an honor to it. It puts a servitude to it. So those Old Testament priests, Hebrews says twice, they stand offering those sacrifices. And Jesus, when he offered the sacrifice, he sat down. The Old Testament priests offered the same sacrifices, and they offered them often. Yeah, it's once a year, but it's more than that. Because they had sacrifices of other things, such as there was a wave offering, a heave offering. There was a... Um, an offering of turtle doves and so on throughout the year. And those sacrifices were done often. But Christ offered one sacrifice one time. And that was himself. It was his blood. Jesus died, and that one offering did some stuff. That one offering sanctified us through faith in Christ. Yeah, you got need to know that the biblical definition of faith com contains your obedience. Yeah, it's there. But it's still through faith. And we need to clear that up. But that's not what I've got this piece up there for. It sanctified us. What does sanctification mean? Set apart and made holy. And so he sanctified us. If you are a Christian, you have been sanctified, at least in God's sight. Understand that. You've been set apart for God. And God has declared you to be holy. I want to show this to you. 
in verse 10, it says we are sanctified once for all. Now what does once for all mean? Doesn't ever have to be done again. It does not have to be done again. In verse 14 it says we are sanctified daily. Now the language is this. You are sanctified once and that sanctification continues daily. It never stops. It never ceases. God is always keeping you in his mind set apart and declared holy. By that one offering we are cleansed. Cleansed of what? Sin. Primarily in this passage it's cleansed from sin. But those Jewish minds did not stop there. Because do you remember uh, if uh, they touched a dead body? They're unclean. If they handled a pig, unclean. If they did any of those things that were out of kelter from the clean and unclean, it made them unclean. And this passage, no, you are cleansed. That's huge in that Jewish mind. To us, we just say, cleanse us from sins and we go on. But that's not what they did. And it gave us a right standing before God. There's the holiness again. Sanctified. Daily. It, is, it does not depend upon your conduct. Whether or not you sin or not. Now is it important for you to purify yourself? Yes. 1 John chapter 3 says... Uh, if any man has this hope in him, he purifies himself even as he is pure. Now, there's a whole lot of theology goes on in that verse, but basically that says that. That's not what's considered here. You are sanctified and God declares you holy. Daily, he tells you, you are holy. So when Peter says... Be ye holy, for I am holy. He is not telling you, you've got to straighten up your life and so on. It is God through the blood of Jesus declaring, you are like me. It's just a declaration. It's not a command. So you are sanctified and he declares you to be right in his sight. That's what righteousness is. How big is that? Because you see under the old law. You were never right because the Messiah hadn't come. Under the old law you were not righteous. <clears throat> well the Old Testament sacrifice is reminded of sin. I guarantee you it reminded the old priest of sin. And when the farmer brings his bull up there to be offered as a sacrifice, it reminded him of sin. But God forgot the sin for a year and it reminded him of sin. So those Old Testament sacrifices are a reminder of sin. But with Jesus, we have remission of sins. And remission means to send away. What does it mean to have your sins remitted? To send them away. <laughs> Joy. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole lot of psychological stuff going on there like guilt and, and so on, you know, relief. But the imagery from the Old Testament is the image of the scapegoat. Now, y'all have heard of the scapegoat. Oh, he was just a scapegoat. Well, 
He's the one who the, the fault has been put on. So we're going to talk about that on the next slide. Our sins in that scapegoat image have been pardoned. That's legal. That's a legal term, pardon. Um, what happens when you get a pardon legally in our country today? You get out of jail. You, of jail. <laughs> you were condemned. In our sins, are we condemned? Yeah. And with our sin, the wrath of God comes. But with the pardon, you've satisfied the law of God against that sin. And they are removed or sent away from you forever. Separating completely out. And so the sanctification is not only set apart from God for God's use. It is also set apart from your sin. That's beautiful. Let's look at the scapegoat. It's found in Leviticus chapter 16 and it's done on the day of atonement. The priest will select two goats and they will bring them to the priest. And the priest will take one and sacrifice it. And he will release the other one as a scapegoat. Now, when he releases that one, he prays over them, confessing the sins of the people. Then the scapegoat is led out into the wilderness and turned loose. And all of the sins of the people for that year are gone. Did you know that in Israel, there's still wild goats? Wonder where they came from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is what Christ did with our sins. There's no more suffering for sin. I'm not accountable to God for those sins anymore. There's no more guilt before God for those sins. I don't have to worry about ever being punished for them. There's no more punishment for sin to the Christian. And because this is because there's no more remembrance of sin wiped away by the blood of Jesus. Now here comes where you get connected. The Holy Spirit witnesses in our hearts. Huh? If you miss this, you're liable to miss the whole point of Christianity. The Holy Spirit witnesses in your hearts. Now, Brandon had that little class a while ago about um, uh, whether or not we know we're saved. I had that conversation standing right there yesterday. A Christian. I know the Bible says I'm saved. Sometimes I just don't feel it. It's not about feeling, is it? She said, I don't know. And I need to know. How do I learn whether or not I'm saved? So, I have a, a little thing I put out at night. And for the next four nights, I'm going to talk about that very thing. So, if you get on Facebook, go look me up. But the Holy Spirit must witness in our hearts. Acts 2.38, the gift of the Holy Spirit is yours because you've been baptized. Acts 5.32, the Holy Spirit is yours because it is, He is your gift. It's not something he gives. Acts 5.32 says he, he is the gift. We have been blessed with this promised new covenant. 
what is the covenant because it has altogether the difference in the, the Holy Spirit being the witness in your heart. This new covenant. Y'all ready to look at it? Let's look at the text. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10 verses 11 through 12. And every high priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. What they did in the temple around the ark. There was a ceremony. It was grandus. It can never take away sins. But this man, <laughs> after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Well, in our culture and in theirs, what does the right hand mean? Right and left with the saved and the lost, yes. But I walk up to you, how are you doing? I never stick out my left hand. It's always the right hand. What is that? Well, it's a hello. It's a okay. I, I meet you. I see you. I understand. No. You go back under the, in the Middle Ages. If I extended my right hand to you, I did not have a sword in it. I was not going to kill you. It is, I, I will accept you, I will not harm you. And it is carried down through the ages till now. It is my authority. And so when Jesus sat down on the right hand of the Father... It's the right hand. It is the authority of God. He is the one to whom we come to for forgiveness. He is the one that we come to for acceptance. It always stood out to me in Matthew when he was given all power in heaven and earth before he gave yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's in him. That's the statement right there. All right, let's move on. Chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now, in the book of Revelation, there is a battle described as the Battle of Armageddon. But you know what happens there? And I had never seen that until about a, two months ago. That battle never occurs. It never occurs. Why does it never occur? Because God doesn't let it occur. They gather against the Son of God, yes. They are ready to do battle against Him. And boom, it's over. They never get to draw a sword. It's done. Expecting. Henceforth expecting. That has to do with looking forward to. His enemies being put down. For by one offering. He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Perfected. It means completed. And it describes your faith in Him. Your sanctification. It is finished. And He's going to say it's going to be done daily. But look at what the Greek says. To make perfect is the same wording as forgiveness of sins. To be, have your faith completed or your sanctification completed is the same as forgiveness of sins. Therefore, 
when I have become a Christian and God sets me apart by forgiving me my sins so I am put in Him, adopted into His family and all the other stuff, it all is one bundle. If I'm not sanctified, I am not forgiven. Can you see that? Verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us after that he had said before. We're going to stop right there. He's fixing to quote a passage from Jeremiah. But we're going to stop right there and we're going to look at this a minute. The Holy Ghost is a witness. Amen. I want you to look to whom the Holy Ghost is a witness to. To us. To us. Now there are some people who will say, well that's in the Word of God. And most certainly, the Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God. It is His Word too. And most certainly, that is a witness to us. Is it not? Alright, there's your first witness. Because your faith comes from hearing the Word of God. Alright. But the second part of this is what he's fixing to say. Let's just hold off on finishing that, what that witness is, until you hear what else he has to say. This is the covenant. The witness is the covenant. That I will make with them in those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in the Bible. No. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So you learn something from the scripture, what it says, and you go about your way, you think, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have felt that. Where do you think that came from? That passage says the Holy Spirit put that there. And do you remember what Jesus said? I will bring, I will send the comforter, and he will bring to remembrance it doesn't mean inspiration there it's the witness of the Holy Spirit reminding me of scripture reminding me of what God expects reminding me Charlie you don't need to be partaking of that you don't need to be thinking that way you don't need to be feeling that way straighten up boy because it's the Holy Spirit in there straightening Charlie up Do you remember what he said? Well, we hadn't got there yet. But he says, if you are his child, he will what? He will chasten you. Because he loves you. And there it is. There it is. (laughs) Verses 17 and 18. Finishes that in their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. If you have the sins and iniquities, will I remember no more? Guess what? You've also got that Holy Spirit prompting you, plugging at you. And I told my people up at New Bethel, my people, the Lord's people at New Bethel. I told them, I said, if you have an urge that you think you need to go do something, you go do it. Because it probably is God telling you that that's what you need to be doing. Is that a... A thing, well, my heart may about not be tuned into God. And it may not be God. So, but if I, my heart is right, if my heart is tuned in to what would God want me to do? How do I, should I feel? How should I think? How should I act? It probably is. You pray about it. The writer goes on to finish that quote. Now where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Now remember he said, those Old Testament priests stand daily and offer the same sacrifices over and over again. But Christ, one sacrifice. And he brought in the new covenant, gave us that Holy Spirit And he says, now I have a thing where I will remember 
their sins no more. That ought to be comforting to you, shouldn't it? So let's bring it together. I got four minutes. In the Jewish mind, the import of this lesson is huge. To us, we just read over it and go on. We're Christians, we've known this stuff, and we go on, but not in the Jewish mind. Because you see, this has told us there's no more scapegoat to let go. They offer those sacrifices over and over and over again. Jesus, one time, you don't do that anymore. No more sacrifices for the altar. Because Jesus has already gone to the altar as the sacrifice with his own blood. No more remembrance of sins. God flushes them right down out of his commode or whatever it is. They're gone. No more Torah to learn. That's where the sacrifices were. You think that wasn't big in the Jewish mind? How we make judgments from the heart. That's where he's writing his laws. And as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the heart come the issues of life. And so that's where God put his impression on you. It's where he put his laws. When we judge now what is pleasing to God. Brandon did an excellent job a while ago with that judging stuff. Who's the only judge? Yeah. And I'm not him. I have no right judging you. The Ten Commandments are no longer necessary. Why? Let me tell you why. Because he's written his law on your heart now. And you have it in you. And not out there on a table of stone. The temple is no longer necessary. Why? Because what's the temple? It's me. It's in my heart. The Abrahamic uh, bloodline is not necessary because it brought Christ in. He's here. It's over with. So that Jewish nation now doesn't mean anything. Not any more than Americans. And God will write in our hearts His law. And that is where we live. That's how we operate. We sing the song, I Love the Lord. Beautiful song. Tommy Wheeler, is that right, Ethan? I Love the Lord. Beautiful song. And when you sing that, you think about what all he's done for you. And what he means to you. And that will be a guide for you to walk on this earth. Just keep him in your mind and keep loving him. Amen.